This film is a project of the Leonore Annenberg Institute for Civics of the Annenberg Public Policy Center of the University of Pennsylvania, in partnership with the Annenberg Foundation Trust at Sunnylands. Citizenship is every person's highest calling. Before we begin, there's something I want to tell you about the First Amendment. It wasn't really the first. The first Congress actually didn't list freedom of speech and of the press first. It actually listed it third on the list. But the first two amendments didn't get ratified by the states. It's a happy coincidence because speech and press are really, in some deep sense, perhaps the most important freedoms. It's really hard to write a constitution. Our own Constitution wasn't the framers' first attempt. Remember the Articles of Confederation? After the Constitution was ratified in 1789, the framers added 10 amendments in the first two years, and even then, they weren't sure they had it right. When you read letters from the time period, they'll say things like, well, if the government's still here in five years, here's what I think we should do. Experience leaves its mark on a Constitution, so when you look at the First Amendment's freedom of speech and freedom of the press... Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. It looks cut and dry. No law means no law, right? Well, not quite. As it turns out, our idea of free speech and a free press has changed a lot over the years. This is the story of how time and experience turn these fundamental rights into what they are today and what the framers only imagined they could be. Today, they're absolutely bedrock. Everyone believes in free speech and free press, but it wasn't always so. Okay, so imagine what life here was like before the Constitution. No we the people, no right to free speech, much less free press. Why? Because the people didn't rule the colonies. The king ruled, and what the people thought was not of interest to the king. The colonists felt very strongly that one of the freedoms that was denied to them by the king was the ability to speak out. They wanted the freedom to be able to speak out and object to their government. They wanted to be able to protest. They wanted to be able to communicate with one another. During the revolutionary era, they clearly had a lot to say. And they had a lot to say that the king would not have liked. And as the Revolutionary War began, a free press, this thing, churning out sheets of paper filled with ideas. Ideas can be powerful, and they were just as dangerous to the king as any gun. The Crown was really trying to stop them from expressing revolutionary ideas and talking to each other and assembling and getting their revolution going. All the protest literature was against the law. The king had a couple of ways of shutting down the press. He could shut down presses before they printed ideas. This is known as prior restraint. A prior restraint is kind of, you know, putting a gag on somebody before they ever talk. So anyone who wanted to use a printing press, basically, had to bring their newspaper, their book, their pamphlet to a government licensor who would read through it, excise anything in there that they thought was inappropriate, which meant critical of the government in any way. This had been banned in England in the 17th century, but when the king's rule was threatened by war, the British government used prior restraint to try to quiet the revolutionary press. And if he couldn't shut them down before they spoke, the king could prosecute revolutionaries after they said anything critical of the government. This has a technical name you'll want to remember, seditious libel. Seditious libel is defined as speaking ill of the government. It's a crime to, to criticize the government. All power was in the king and parliament, and they couldn't be questioned. But the king lost the war. And when the framers wrote the Bill of Rights, they remembered how important the press had been to winning their freedom. They were accustomed to the idea that criticizing the government is a good thing to do. That became part of their um, idea of what it means to be in a democracy. In a democracy where the idea is that the people would have the authority to select their leaders, then it was important for the people to actually know what the government was doing. Democracy depends on an informed citizenry. In order for democracy to function effectively and to function with integrity, the public needs to know what's going on. So the First Amendment says the government can't stop us from expressing ourselves. The First Amendment carries these core principles. 
that are all necessary in order for people to find their voice in a democracy. It includes both freedom of speech and freedom of the press. The freedom of speech protects us when we talk to each other, when we give speeches and we put ideas forward. The press is an institutional means for spreading those ideas to a large number of people. So the freedom of speech and press work together. Individual speakers could all, of course, give, give speeches and hand out leaflets and so on, but they saw the press as a more important player in an institutional sense in American democracy and in a better position to keep the government honest uh, because the press had the capacity to use resources to learn information and to convey information in a broader way than an individual speaker could. And the First Amendment protects both speech and the press from the government. It says that the government can't tell you to shut up uh, because it doesn't like what you're saying. So the First Amendment was ratified, and we've had total freedom of the press ever since, and this is the shortest civics film you've ever had to watch. Um, no. In fact, the men who wrote and then ratified freedom of speech and freedom of the press were the very first ones to try to undo them. When the government goes into motion in the 1790s, there's still a lot of debate about exactly what the Constitution means and exactly how far this new government can go. So they're arguing as to what the Constitution means, and these are the people who wrote it. After George Washington left office, some of the framers tried to limit free speech in the press because they were afraid of war. The Alien and Sedition Act was signed into law by President Adams in 1798. He is the leader of essentially a house divided. France was growing in power, and as it threatened Europe and the U.S., fear of war increased tension between the two new political parties at home. President John Adams, a Federalist, signed the Alien and Sedition Acts into law. He was afraid the French might topple the young U.S. government with the help of the Democratic Republicans, led by his vice president, Thomas Jefferson. The Sedition Act basically made it a federal crime to criticize the president. The act made it a federal crime to criticize Congress. Now, interestingly, it wasn't a federal crime to criticize the vice president, who was the head of the other political party. Remember, back in those days, the president and vice president were the top two vote-getters in each election, so they were rivals, not from the same party. The Sedition Act protected only one party and punished the other. And the Adams administration felt that the Jeffersonians favored the French and they called them disloyal. The way the act was used was exclusively to prosecute um, Republican critics of the Adams administration. Like Congressman Matthew Lyon, who spent four months in prison for criticizing the president. This is ridiculous. This is a gross violation of the First Amendment idea, of the free speech idea. You can't have a law that makes it a crime to bring the government or the president or the Congress into contempt or disrepute. That's what the First Amendment's about. So you might want to ask about now, where were the courts? Why didn't they set things straight? Well, at this point in American history, the courts had yet to overturn a federal law. In fact, the entire concept of courts stepping in to fix federal laws, what we call judicial review, wasn't established in the Supreme Court until Marbury versus Madison. So Congressman Lyon and the others in prison were out of luck. But a funny thing happened with the press and the Sedition Act. The funny thing that happened is that it didn't quell dissent. In fact, dissent from the opposition party increased during the two and a half years that the Sedition Act was in effect. The number of opposition newspapers doubled. Voters threw John Adams out of office in the bitter election of 1800, largely because they disliked his interpretation of the First Amendment. So it was a long time before another president thought that limiting free speech was a good idea. Jump ahead over 100 years to World War I and President Woodrow Wilson. This time, the president and Congress passed the Espionage Act of 1917 and the Sedition Act of 1918, saying Americans can't interfere with the government's ability to draft people into the military. But their effect was greater than that. The laws were used in a way that suppressed speech and punished uh, people who were merely dissenting against government policy, how the war was being conducted. 
Thousands of people were arrested and put in prison for hampering the draft by speaking against it. The most famous was Eugene V. Debs. Debs, a socialist, had been a candidate for president in the previous election. He was a nationally known figure. A man who gets a million votes, a million votes running for president, gets up and makes a speech saying that he thinks World War I is a bad war. And he is prosecuted under the Sedition Act, and he's in prison. Debs was sentenced to 10 years in prison for giving a speech. The court sent people to prison for speech considered dangerous because it might cause a bad reaction. By this time, there was judicial review, so the Supreme Court heard cases challenging these laws, and in each case, the court sided with the government. In the first of those cases, a case called Schenck versus the United States, the Supreme Court, in an opinion by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, unanimously upheld the conviction of individuals who'd handed out a bunch of leaflets criticizing the draft. The Supreme Court uh, embarked on a very repressive interpretation of the First Amendment. It was Justice Holmes' clear and present danger test. Justice Holmes argued that lowering morale for the draft presented a clear and present danger to the nation and that the First Amendment did not protect free speech at all costs. No law didn't always mean no law. Justice Holmes said, suppose someone yells fire in a crowded theater when he knows there's no fire and people are trampled running to the exits. Are you really saying he can't be punished for this? Holmes says, of course not. So the First Amendment obviously can't mean what it superficially appears to say. Only a week later, the court ruled against Eugene Debs. And the Supreme Court unanimously upholds his conviction. Another opinion by Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, that was in the front page of every paper in the United States. The Schenck case, the Debs case, ultimately had the US Supreme Court giving its stamp of approval upon the criminalization of dissent. But then something amazing happened. The Debs decision got a lot of people thinking about what freedom of speech and freedom of the press really meant during wartime. Among them was Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. And that fall, he argued in a famous dissent that actually free expression during wartime shouldn't be prosecuted, but protected. And so you get this extraordinary moment of pivoting in which Holmes suddenly wakes up. And for the first time, we have this strong, eloquent statement by Holmes that basically begins for the first time to articulate the meaning of freedom of speech and freedom of the press in this country. Joined by Justice Louis Brandeis, they influenced court rulings on the First Amendment for the rest of the century. We had to protect people who dissent. There's a marketplace of ideas out there, even ideas that challenge basic things in our society. And everybody has to have their opportunity to change the mind of the nation. The position of Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes and the position that Justice Louis Brandeis took in subsequent cases gradually and eventually becomes the law. Over the next 50 years, the court moved away from government suppressing free speech back to the idea that free speech is a vital way to check the government. What you see are the, are the justices going back in time to a fundamental recognition that the founding generation kind of had the right idea that dissent, that protests, was something that enabled us to break away and start our own nation. The court has come full circle. They learn it with hindsight. They look back at what happened in World War I. That was crazy. In the same way that after 1800, people looked back on the Sedition Act of 1798 and said, what were we doing? This was not necessary. We completely allowed ourselves to exaggerate the danger and to restrict fundamental freedoms in a democracy because we were not acting calmly and carefully. So on a summer Sunday in June 1971, when Daniel Ellsberg bought a stack of copies of the New York Times, the front page made him very happy. N no, not the story about President Nixon's daughter getting married. This one to the right. There had been a leak, and a top-secret U.S. government document was now being trumpeted as a headline on the front page of the New York Times. Daniel Ellsberg was the leak. In fact, more like a flash flood. Ellsberg had given the New York Times a 7,000-page report that became known 
as the Pentagon Papers. The Pentagon Papers was a multi-volume work by individuals in the Department of Defense that would tell the story of how decisions were made, who made them to navigate the war in Vietnam. A history of all that the U.S. had done right and all that the U.S. had done wrong with the benefit of hindsight. And uh, Daniel Ellsberg, who was someone who worked in the Department of Defense and who was a strong advocate of the Vietnam War, came around to a different point of view. Daniel Ellsberg had been in the Marines for a while. He had served uh, in Vietnam. Uh, he had been in favor of the war. Ellsberg was involved with creating the report, and the more he learned, the more Ellsberg believed that the government had lied about why it went to war in Vietnam, and that its policies were covering up the fact that the U.S. was losing the war. That report revealed some of the sins of the policy. The Pentagon Papers revealed that the American people had been lied to in a variety of very significant ways that had manipulated them into being more uh, sympathetic to our role in Vietnam that they might have been had they known the truth. Daniel Ellsberg wanted the American people to have this information so they could know what their government was doing. But the report was classified top secret. The way the classification system works, the highest level of classification of a document, the most secret document, is the one which determines how the whole document would be labeled. So all 7,000 pages of the Pentagon Papers were classified top secret, even though it wasn't information that endangered troops. But some of it was deeply embarrassing to the government and our allies. Daniel Ellsberg secretly photocopied every page. First, he tried to get members of Congress to make the report available to the public. And they basically say, classified information is classified. We see no reason to regard anything you've told us as justifying violating the rules against publishing and disclosing classified information. When they did not do that, uh, he went to the press. He turned them over to the New York Times and uh, basically said, now you know the truth, um, make it public. And after months of poring over each photocopied page, that's exactly what the New York Times did. Right there on its front page, secrets revealing that the government had not told the truth to the American people about the war in Vietnam. And it was only the first article. The Times announced it would publish an entire series of articles about the Pentagon Papers. Hello. Mr. President, I have Dr. Kissinger calling you. Okay. Thank you. At first, President Richard M. Nixon was slow to respond. Hello, Mr. President. The Pentagon Papers covered the four administrations before President Nixon, so they didn't reveal secrets specifically about his administration. Still... Well, this is treasonable action. Exactly, Mr. President. Doesn't it involve secure information, a lot of other things? It has the highest classification. Yeah. Yeah. What, what do we do about it? Over the first 48 hours, different aides told the president the Times was wrong to publish top-secret information. This uh, New York Times expose of the most highly classified documents of the war. This is a devastating uh, security breach of, of the greatest magnitude of anything I've well, seen. You simply cannot allow a newspaper to publish classified documents. They justify this. And President Nixon ultimately agreed. The position of the Nixon administration was that they were betraying the freedom of the press. And, and freedom of the press does not, is not the freedom to uh, destroy the integrity of the government. After only three days of articles, the Nixon administration convinced the courts to stop the Times from publishing any more installments. What Richard and Nixon's administration did was historically unprecedented. They went into federal court asking federal judges to issue an order stopping publication of, of the Pentagon Papers. The New York Times was enjoined. It was stopped from reporting the rest of the story. Ellsberg was undaunted. He ultimately succeeded in getting the Washington Post to publish the story. And the court stopped the Post from publishing. But Daniel Ellsberg didn't stop, and neither did the press. 
Across the country, newspapers began publishing what the Times and the Post couldn't as the Times and the Post headed to the Supreme Court. The court heard and decided the case in only four days. The most rapidly expedited case in American history. On June 30, 1971, the Supreme Court ruled that the government could not prevent newspapers from publishing the Pentagon Papers. They didn't have time to write together, so each justice wrote his own opinion, breaking down into a six to three majority. The majority told the government that even in wartime, it could not stop the press from publishing unless it really jeopardized lives or the nation's security. And amazingly, what the Supreme Court holds is that the government cannot stop them for a moment unless the government can prove that the publication of the information will create a clear and present danger of grave harm to the nation. Justice William O. Douglas wrote that open debate and discussion of public issues are vital to our national health, even if revealing secrets may have a serious impact. It was really the first time that the Supreme Court came out explicitly during a, a time of national crisis and said that we have to draw a line here. People need to know about that. In dissent, Justice Harry Blackmun warned that the decision could lead to the death of soldiers, the destruction of alliances, and the inability of our diplomats to negotiate. And the dissenters in the Pentagon Papers case say basically, what are you, crazy? This, is, this makes no sense at all. But all the government wants to do here is to have time to give us an opportunity to know what the risks are. Now, it turns out that the truth is, when all the dust settled, nothing published in the Pentagon Papers um, would satisfy the standard of clear and present danger of imminent harm. The Pentagon Papers case was an extraordinary triumph in reaffirming some of our most essential First Amendment values. After almost 200 years, the court held the government accountable to those First Amendment values. Freedom of speech and freedom of the press are the priority, even during wartime. So the difference between what the court did in World War I and what the court does here is about as night and day as one could ever imagine, right? A complete 180 degree change in its willingness to step in and say, we are going to enforce the First Amendment with a vengeance. It's not a decision that comes out of the blue, right? There's an evolution in the doctrine. And technology is also evolving. Today, just about anyone can publish. General Ellsberg had 7,000 pages of the Pentagon Papers. And in order to get it out there to the, to the public, he had to make copies of it and give it to newspaper editors. You could put the entire Pentagon Papers on a thumb drive and upload it yourself to a website. But the decision in the Pentagon Papers case continues to protect the press. The press can be critical, and the government can't tell it what or what not to publish. The First Amendment, the deep idea is don't trust government to make that decision. Voters should make that decision for themselves. Readers should make that decision for themselves. Ordinary citizens, we the people can decide for ourselves. The freedom of the press is an extraordinarily important aspect of uh, the First Amendment. And it's important because the Constitution works on a checks and balances system. But there's another part of the equation, and that really is the people. The people are really the fourth branch of government. You have to know what the government is doing. 